Welcome to the Human Origin Project, where we explore the science of you. To keep up to date, go to our iTunes channel and subscribe, and please leave a review if you enjoyed today's show. Hello and welcome to today's show. Today we're going to be talking about the fascinating period in human history called the Younger Dryas period. And it's a time that predates human civilization and actually lines up very closely to when modern civilization began to live in its present form. It dates roughly to 12,000 years ago when the agricultural revolution was occurring and it describes a period of tumultuous conditions on planet Earth and this becomes a multidisciplinary scientific discussion about the geology and the environment that the planet was going through at the time when human civilization was rising. It's a fascinating conversation and we will be featuring this topic more and more because there's many areas, but today we're going to give you an overview on the Younger Dryas period. Hello and welcome to the show. Steph, how's your week this week? Yeah, it's been good. It's been interesting. Doing a, I went to a uh, meditation night last night. That was a kind of a sound relaxation meditation session. Um, yeah, it was fun. It was interesting. Yeah, it's always interesting. I've been trying to integrate meditation practice into my kind of daily routine. And it's, it's, it's a real learning process and I find that going to classes like that help you, you know, take steps forward in how you integrate into daily life. I, I still struggle with that, but it's something that I always find that those kind of things help you burst through those, those doors, right? Yeah, definitely. And I feel like there is this kind of block that needs to be removed to get into this it, it's it's not only the conversations about the, this sort of these sorts of topics, but act, the actual practice. It takes a lot to snap you out of your daily, the, you know, the lives that we've grown up living to sort of change our perspective slightly and start opening up to these other ideas and to look within, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but today we're actually going to look a little bit outside um, our realm of you know what in terms of where humans came from look at the geological uh, context of you know how humans and human history a really crucial point is what we found is the agricultural revolution and looking back through our history and context you, know, you kind of get you know you read mon- modern history and then back into ancient history and really we follow the line from you know potentially the Greeks to e- Egyptians which goes through about 3200 BC and then pre-dynastic e- Egypt gets a bit fuzzy and then things really kind of get really murky from there right yeah 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 the further back you go you sort of the mud, the waters get muddy and then right where uh, agriculture first pops up just before that was the end of the last glacial period or the end of the last ice age as most people th- think of it as yeah which is interesting and the the agricultural revolution is that real starting point from where modern society really changed. And you look at this was uh, this was really kind of brought upon me when starting to look at anthropological studies. And they talk about the changes that happens in human teeth. For instance, we see tooth decay pop up at the agricultural revolution. And I remember seeing that and going, "Wow, that's such a huge change." And you look at the time span of which we find human records on Earth, which goes back two million years. You only see these diseases in the last 12,000 years. And that really kind of broke my perspective on, you know, how today we're in a modern iteration of humans and we kind of just group all of the prehistory stuff, you know, you know, really into a, you know, this very primal and very ancestral um, you know, line. But we... D- we don't really attribute as to why the agricultural revolution happened. We know what, you know, what and how it happened but we don't know why and really we don't really know how either do we no it's one of the most yeah the period before of when we were exiting the last ice age that period of of history is really little it's little of it is understood the mech both the mechanisms of how we exited and why and you know what led up to that point because i guess we'll get into it a bit later but that period of earth's history is very interesting once you start looking into it very climate lot, lot, a lot of earth changes happening uh yeah and we're only now in the last sort of like two decades people are starting to put a picture together about what was going on and, and how 
yeah, how it all happened. And, you know, when you think of human history, you really kind of focus on human events instead of looking at context around. And this really kind of spans into how geological science, you know, interlocks with, you know, things like anthropology, archaeology, and, you know, you have to look at the environmental context around, you know, what influence, you know, mass species, movements, uh, biological shifts, and the earth is obviously, obviously instrumental in affecting all living creatures. And but we, I think we kind of disconnect this in the scientific realms, and we're going to delve into a geological uh, phenomena today that really paints into, you know, why it paints the context of why or what kind of conditions were around during the agricultural revolution. And I think that's something that really spoke to me about this whole um, study of this period in time. And it's when the last ice age ends, isn't it? And so we call this the transition from the Pleistocene to the Holocene, which is our current era. And it all happened about 12,000 years ago when the agricultural revolution occurred. Yeah, and the it, it's, another, it's another way uh, looking, especially from a geological perspective, um, you need to have a shift of perspective in understanding uh, these changes because, you know, what, what is taught to geologists at the moment and archaeologists is this, this really gradualistic approach to change. So things, things change, but really, really slowly. You know, one, I think they say one drop of water, one grain of sand at a time. And you can sort of look at things happening now and extrapolate that back and understand what, um, what was going on before. Yeah, and this makes a lot of sense when you're thinking about very long geological times, which, you know, for most part, the 20th century, uh, you know, scientific community has focused on these really long span periods. How do we understand, you know, the age of the earth and, you know, you know, continent movement, stuff like that. But geology also happens over shorter periods as well. And this is really where, you know, late, well, during the 20th century and later 20th century, we have this advancement into understanding what happens in shorter periods and, you know, in environmental uh, conditions that really influence, you know, our time span as well. So what happened in this agricultural um, period, 12,000 years, were there geological changes that were happening? And there was one guy that really looked looked at this through the 20th century, didn't he? Yeah, he was uh, a geologist named J. Harlan Bretz, who, um, who spent most of his professional life, which was, you know, 50, 60 plus years on the ground, in North America, looking at this evidence of huge geological changes that took place at the end of the last ice age, and then you know he was documenting, um, he he was collecting evidence of these giant mega floods that just tore through North America, and um, and this was before the time where um, aerial scans were possible, be- before it was you know financially viable to go up and take scans from the from the air to understand what was going on. So he was scrabbling around on his hands and knees, you know, collecting, painstakingly collecting evidence. Yeah, it seems trivial now because now we've got things like drones that can just fly straight up and take a picture from the top. But in the 20s, that's really, really expensive and difficult. And so geologists didn't have that perspective to shape how they're, you know, building their... So they had to basically dig in and look at the, the fine little granules. So you can understand why, what you know, the perspective was on this very slow build-up because that's all we could look at. But then when you kind of zoom out, which is, you know, a lot of what we look at and, you know, change our context, you know, once you bring that other level of evidence, you know, looking at the ground from, you know, a few, a couple hundred metres above, you start to see like, well, hang on, was there a larger cycle going on? Yeah, and it seems obvious to us now that we have the technology to do that. Um, But back then, Brett's especially was coming up against this dogmatic science that was talking about gradualism as the only mechanism between but that drove geological change and his his idea and hit the evidence that he amassed pointed towards these huge earth changes that happened catastrophically so in small amounts of time changes would would occur that that reshaped entire landscapes and even the planet yeah and it really centered around the landscape of north america didn't it how that the a lot of certain geological features were uh, argued to be this gradual, slow um, result of you know, ice movements and water flows 
whereas he was arguing that some of these features were actually um, carved quite quickly. And there's areas, for instance, up in Washington, there's Dry Falls area, and you compare these things and the timescales that we look at, you're talking about very large, violent acts in very small amounts of time, right? Yeah, so what what Bretz was trying to argue was that um, at the end of the last ice age, when all the ice over North America melted, so that there used to be 4 million more cubic miles of ice on the planet than there are, is today. And though that all of that situated over North America. You know, most of Canada was covered in ice. Most of North, most of the USA was covered, even across most of Western Europe. And um, and the ice wasn't the ice. It was in some areas the ice was two miles thick, which is insane to think about. That's two miles a huge of amount ice. of ice, isn't it? Yeah. And one of the reasons Bretts was so um, passionate about researching this was because. Up until that point, and even to this day, no one can explain how that ice melted so rapidly. There was nothing, there's nothing on Earth that could account for, um, you know, melting and moving that ice. And let's just give the perspective of what he's describing is that, so roughly 20,000 years ago, we were started to exit the last ice age. And this was the Pleistocene period, which was a full, what we call a full glacial period, where all these extra ice caps were situated over North America and some of Western Europe and then from 20,000 years there was a gradual rise in temperatures wasn't there until 12,000 years which is the borderline of the Pleistocene where we move into the current era the prehistoric era uh, the Holocene and so what he was talking about potentially that is that there was some kind of violent shift that occurred in this period yeah and it, it wasn't only uh, the ice that melted there were these other things going on on the planet at the time so to get to paint a bit of a picture of what was happening um, the last ice age peaked at about 20,000 years ago give or take and you know leading up until the start of the younger dry ice which was roughly 12,800 years ago the earth was exiting the full grips of an ice age and moving into a more stable interglacial period so global temperatures were rising steadily naturally um, the ice sheets were getting smaller you know uh, there was a more stable climate like there is today um, and then something happened 12,800 years ago that threw the earth back into the depths of the ice age you know global temperatures dropped 10 to 15 degrees and it was it was that point in time where the ice caps out of nowhere just started growing again yeah so that's why don't we go back just before we move into that period um, and to explain what Brett was trying to explain to his colleagues because he was long uh, criticised for his view that things happened quickly. But his whole view, he, didn't he say that there was evidence in North America that something happened quite quickly in this period? Mm, yeah, he, he, he would... He, all this evidence that he was amassing and all, this docu- do- all the documented... Trudging around the landscape. Yeah, just wandering around, taking notes, um, trying to convince people of... Like, he was looking at these extinct cataracts, like, these, like picture Niagara Falls without any water in it. That's kind of the things he was seeing again and again all through North America. And he was, he was trying to convince people that this had to be the result of extreme climatic conditions. And it couldn't just be gradual or gradualistic mechanisms that drove it because nothing there's nothing gradualist about some i mean you you see we'll we'll post some of these images on our website um but once you start seeing the pictures and trying to get your head around the number like the the scale and the the amount of water you're talking about thousands of times the volume of water of niagara falls aren't you yeah there's one place in particular dry falls which is 600 feet high there's no water running through it anymore but 600 feet high for some perspective on that, Niagara Falls is about 165 feet high. So it's, you know, three over three times as big. It's huge sheer cliffs that look like, you know, basically Niagara Falls without the water. Yeah, and and the latest research is suggesting that that all, that was created and then, you know, abandoned by water within, you know, a few years, which is just mind-blowing. And to put that into perspective as well, Bretz was going around the, in the 20th century pointing to these things saying, hey, this could have been a big flood or a big rush of water. And they were saying, no, 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 it's gradual. Yeah. This is this whole argument of which geological phenomena only happens gradually or for the most part. Yet he was talking about, you know, a potentially recent event that 
um, that shaped the landscape significantly. And he he was a, he ended up being awarded a very prestigious. It was the Penrose Medal. Yeah, was the it? Penrose geology. Medal, which is the highest the highest honor in geology. And he was given that when he was, you know, in his eighties, I think maybe even his nineties. After he'd been fighting with the whole. Yeah, and one of his one of his comments at the end, he was he was sort of saying something to the effect of, "Oh, this is all well and good, but you know, all of my all of my opponents are dead, so I've I've got no one left to gloat over." Which is so his kind of his whole life was battling these people who were calling him a lunatic for even suggesting that. It's a bit sad, that isn't it? That you know he he had to come to that kind of you know it, it felt very empty to him because the people weren't around to turn their opinions. Yeah, it's, but it's it, it's so great that there were. I mean, it would have been so tough, but that there are people who stick with this and they just know that it's so important to get that information out. And without people like Brett's, you know, paving the way. We would have no idea. And, you know, the more that we've been researching and other people are researching this period of the Younger Dryas, we're kind of realising that it was more profound than Brett's could have imagined. Like, it's it's beyond belief, some of the earth changes that were going on during um, during that period, that roughly 13 to 1400 year period of earth changing events. Yeah, and what we're discussing today is really subsequent evidence that shows that there was an event and um, Brett's contributed significantly to this idea to, in the ge- geological uh, scientific community that there are very significant, very recent events that potentially occurred but now subsequently there's been this whole uh, discovery of, of a phenomena that occurred and it's all pointing to the same era of time which points to the agricultural revolution which why we're you know why we cover it so importantly because I think as this podcast progresses, setting this context of what we scientifically understand about the agricultural revolution is really important because it helps us to frame what was happening on the planet at that time. From a much, you know, you zoom right out and say, right, let's look at the planet, you know, twelve thousand years ago. What's happening? And you know, why would human civilization rise? I think that's really important and something that we haven't incorporated in our scientific models of why humans began farming yeah it is so important and it is having that context of you know we know that we started for our people started farming and the agricultural revolution began but you know what happened in to the world at that time i think is as important as what the people were doing like coming learning about these changes and, and trying to imagine how people came straight out of that and then invented agriculture just at the drop of a hat it doesn't really make sense yeah completely and w- what really kind of sparked is the brett's kind of like pointed to these huge signs in the land and you know there are marks all over north america they have this huge ripples in the in the is it the uh, pr- camas prairie camas i think prairie, yeah and like yeah. these huge ripples and you can imagine you've seen them on the beach these kind of waves that um, that are formed by sea levels going through just the sand, but then you can imagine the amount of water, and this you can calculate all this, how much water it would take. And it's pretty simple geology, yet you need the perspective of zooming up to see it. But recently, uh, or reasonably recently, uh, another area um, of scientific study has, has revealed this period was subject to a very, very violent change. And so if we go back to you know the Earth exiting out of the Ice Age, uh, from 20,000 years at 12,800 years ago something happened didn't it and it all was discovered by a flower in Europe yeah that, that that's where the younger dryas period gets its name there was a uh, a species of wildflower called the dryas octopetala i think um, which which grows in glacial conditions so it, it was found everywhere in the record during the last ice age and then it disappeared as we were exiting out of this natural um, warming period, and then it it reappears right when the Earth got pulled back into the ice. Uh, the the younger dryas began, and the Earth got pulled back into the full glacial conditions. This flower pops up and and thrives again for the next, you know, twelve hundred years until the end of the younger dry. So that was really how scientists first understood that there was something strange that going on at this at this time. This flower that depended on this low temperature was yeah suddenly disappeared or not suddenly maybe gradually disappeared then suddenly reappeared and it was 1100 years wasn't it so at 12,800 years we were we were more or less rising out then all of a sudden we were thrown back in and 
what's really interesting is that the uh, you know the context of the of a full glacial period so we have all that ice you know that that all the volume of ice sitting over north america suddenly it also disappears at that time too doesn't it so that so the the geological signs that Brett was pointing to and the body of ice sitting over north america we then see the temperature drop which was first discovered via the flowering of this plant and finding in the geological records but then we started to see that there was actual temperature drops as well and that was recorded in the greenland ice cores yeah and that there were you know we're talking about 20 of 10 or 15 degrees celsius changes in decades which you know today we're talking about climate change and that's it's really you know detrimental to the planet if if temperatures change you know five degrees over decades whereas this change was 10 to 15 degrees in the blink of an eye it's just it's it's hard to put that into perspective and it wasn't only these temperature changes but all these at the start both at the start and the end of the younger dryas there was uh these um spikes in sea level rises so right at the start whatever caused it whatever caused the ice to melt there was this huge influx of fresh water into the oceans um not only happening at the start but also at the end of the younger dryas so all the ice melts in two big hits so there was more ice over north america and then what we've recorded is there was was a 400 foot sea level rise yeah throughout the entire period from the start of the younger dryas to the end of it sea levels rose in two main melt melt water pulses right yeah meltwater pulse 1a and meltwater pulse 1b are kind of like the bookends to the younger dryas period so there were two events that melted the ice and there you can see the these spikes in the record it's just it boggles the mind to think that we have the record like the rock hard scientific evidence that the the planet was going through all of this all at one time we were exiting out of the ice age suddenly thrown back into the ice age temperatures plummet for 1200 years then we see you know these ice age conditions pop pop back up you know this flower blooms uh we see the sea levels rise it, it's the the land mass of china and europe basically being devoured isn't it in the very very short space of time mm, yeah and if, if we imagine that happening today i mean most of the major cities are built on the coastline or built on a river system or near water most of the most of the planet's major cities would vanish if we had a if we had a 400 foot sea level rise today civilization would be flattened there would be almost nothing left of you know the major cities in the world well we're talking i mean climate change does talk about sea level rise but it's it's tiny compared to this and what really brought me to this kind of shocking realization about how significant this was was the data from the Greenland ice core, um, which were meticulously extracted from the pure Greenland um, ice, and what it showed. And the thing, the funny thing, is that everyone focuses on the the very recent changes and how we're having fluctu- you know, uh, increases of a couple of degrees potentially, um, and how disastrous that would be. But then you look at the younger dry ice period as we were exiting from the Pleistocene to the Holocene, and you've got this huge downward drop, and it's like it's you know, 15 times the magnitude of anything we're seeing now, and then it flies back up at 11,600 years. And at the same time, you know, human civilization pops up right at that point when the temperature run rises back up. And it's like, how could this be? You know, it's, it doesn't really paint the context of which... Yeah, how do you come from that sort of earth change to then, you know, the, the temperatures rise and it's all fine again, and we just invent ag- agriculture and carry on our merry way? It's just like... It's hard to imagine coming out of something like that and just spawning what what would shape, you know, where we are today in terms of civilization. Yeah, and in terms of the agricultural revolution going back to, you know, anthropological records, you know, we have records going back, you know, roughly two million years of humans being on Earth and we say, well, we were hunter-gatherers for all this time and then suddenly 12,000 years, which is a tiny, tiny... If you drew a, um, you know, a line a metre long, you could barely draw... 12,000 years that would represent the two mil- the whole 2 million years time that we've been on earth so you could barely draw it on that line that's how recent it is in terms of the whole scale and so you start to see like how tiny you know our modern society is in terms of the large scales of time but then we're seeing very very significant very violent you know geological um 
context shifting right before human civilization rises. And I, I, for me, I've always, when as soon as I started to see this area of study, I, I just can't, it doesn't fathom to me that we can explain why after 2 million years you would just pop into agriculture. I mean, maybe it was a bottleneck. Maybe it was really hard to survive and we had to farm, for instance. That's maybe one explanation. Um, but if you're surviving, surely, you know, being a hunter-gatherer would be easier because, and the other thing that happens at this time is the megafauna disappear from North America too, isn't it? Don't they? Yeah, so at the moment, uh, the largest population of megafauna on the planet is Africa. Um, and you think of elephants and giraffes and antelope and all these big animals. If you go back to the end of the last ice age, um, around 13,000 years ago, North America was home to the largest population of megafauna on the planet. You know, there were uh, giant armadillos, giant ground sloths, you know, 30 feet tall, um, giant beavers, mammoths, mastodons, um, the American lion, which was as big as a horse, these huge mammals, and they all vanish at the same time as these temperature changes are going on and these huge mega floods are are flowing through North America. And it paints a really grim picture for the people that were alive at that time too because there's a there's in the record there's the um, one of the first well there's a lot of debate going on about that but one of the cultures that lived in North America at the time were known as the Clovis people and they they disappear at the same time as all these events going on so it really puts into perspective how um, insane life would have been on earth at that time not only were there these sea level rises and mega floods. There was also this um, extinction event for not only people but the megafauna that were living, you know, for millions of years before that. Yeah, and now you're starting to see, you know, because we're connecting geology to biology. It's like, well, you know, really, there's a there's a, a very significant, you know, discussion we need to have about how those conditions shaped, you know, what eventually would rise. You know, our, our modern civilization, and so you know, megafauna disappearing. Humans are classed as a large mammal, so we're in the same cat- category as many of these megafauna that went, went extinct. There was a population there that um, the Clovis people they uh, they use a specific spear, didn't they? And they actually they had a ver- there there is little record, but there's there's record that they mined, that they had a, a religious or a ceremonial kind of they use red ochre for instance which is used across the planet um, in ancient societies for ceremonial purposes and so there was a significant amount of people present that suddenly vanished and this really starts to it's like a murder mystery in a way isn't it like there's all these kind of little points of evidence fingerprints that are pointing potentially to an event and you know it is a mystery as to how the North American ice sheet vanished so quickly and we still don't have an explanation for that. Anyone that's seen, um, watched the movie An Inconvenient Truth by Al Gore will recall him talking about the exit of the last ice age and how significant that flood of water was into the Atlantic and the, the current blocking of the Atlantic Ocean. And I remember seeing that in his movie and thinking, well, that is really significant. And the funny thing is, is that since 2001 when he released that movie despite the increase in conversation in global warming we've not tried to discuss why this north american ice sheet broke it is the most significant event in modern human civilization yet we've not understood it yet all this evidence is kind of you know coming up and showing a, a, a you know a decent explanation of what's happening yet we've still not put it together yeah and i think that's why it's it's so important to have this discussion where we can draw on lots of interdisciplinary fields and talk about you know not only what was happening in terms of the climate but also the geology and also anthropology and also you know in the animal record um there is just to to paint a bit of a picture of how catastrophic this event was um you know that they've found huge woolly mammoths that were flash frozen so quickly that the food in their stomach is still fresh to this day when like when they've been ex- when they've found mammoth remains the food is still fresh in their stomach even sometimes so cold that the food in their mouth is still fresh which you know if, if a person dies 
the food in their stomach still gets digested. That still keeps working for a few days after, whereas for for that to, on, on the scale of a mammoth, the... I don't know how quickly it would it's have... It's basically chewing on grass and being... Yeah, and then flattened, boom, he's frozen. Five tons of meat frozen through. It's it's It doesn't make sense. It's, and they can tell that in the difference in the research, can't they? They can tell the difference between a mammoth that has died over or something that's flash frozen. It's Yeah, and there's all, these, there's all this evidence of these mammoths that were standing up and then, you know, all that's left are their feet in the mud and their bodies have been thrown back. Like, well, so actual just or hoofs or foot yeah left and then wow and then these carcasses of mammoths kind of just all twisted up and like there was a huge burst of air or a burst of something that shot them back and not only that but there are these mass graveyards of all sorts of megafauna that sort of it seems like there was this one event that sort of wiped the majority of them out i mean they weren't they didn't all go extinct at that time but they're dating back to that time there are evidence of these like mass graveyards they call them where they've all died of natural causes and we still don't know what what in the world caused that to happen i think they found some evidence of woolly mammoths living in the siberian era to a little bit later didn't they but ultimately they more or less you know the majority went missing 75 percent wasn't it yeah 75 percent of all the megafauna in north america which was like 120 species just disappeared crazy and the funny thing too is that all of those, so all that evidence, you know, this is um, all showing up in the geological record, but then there's other stuff that's popping up in terms of, so all of these can be dated to a certain level. This is how geologists, um, you know, build their data. But then there is a sediment layer that they're examining that shows there was an unusual um, uh, environment on Earth during straight after this period that there was a black mat layer yeah they call, it, they call it the black mat layer and, and some people thought it was because of the the wildfires that went through there were there were to make to make this picture even more bleak at the time of the younger dryas there were wildfires covering most of the planet it's something like 10 percent of the earth's biomass was on fire and so that left a carbon footprint so a black like like one little layer. If you look at the pictures, you yeah. see kind of normal rock, and then you see this one black layer going through, right? Yeah, but they're not quite sure if the black layer is from the soot or if it's just because uh, conditions on Earth were so wet and so soggy that there was just like this layer of, you know, decomposing forest land or decomposing whatever. And they can date that exactly to twelve thousand eight hundred years, right? Yeah, and what's what's fascinating about that layer? is below it you find all of these extinct mammals and these uh, bones of the Clovis people and, and bones of, you know, all sorts of animals that no longer exist. But then above it, there's no sign of it. So it's like whatever happened to cause the Younger Dryas left this left this mark that sort of clamped um, that period of history closed and then, you know, the new, the new chapter began. Well, and then, so, yeah, the Younger Dryas took hold the megafauna disappear, the Clovis people disappear, North America seems to be ripped through, but the, the ice sheet seemed, grew in that time as well, didn't it? Yeah, so when at the start of the Younger Dryas, when the temperature dropped and, you know, we went back into a, a period of full glaciation, um, there was about 1,200 years of that, the 1,200 years of a climate like that on Earth. So the ice, ice sheets grew again to as big as they were, if not bigger. And after that, you've got 1,100 years of basically terror on the planet, potentially. And then all of a sudden, you see in the Greenland ice cores that the temperatures rise up 10 to 15 degrees to their current form. So we, we come out of the ice age into our current form almost overnight as well, don't we? Yeah, and it's, it's almost as violent as the start. So at the start of the Younger Dryas, it's this intense cooling period where we're sucked into the depths of the ice age again. Um, and then at the end, we're temperatures shoot back up which is also the exact same time as there's another huge meltwater meltwater spike in the ocean so whatever ice was left you know melts melts rapidly and um from that period to the period we're in now it's been one of the most stable climatic periods in the earth's history or at least what the greenland ice cores tell us for the last sort of 250,000 years this this last 12,000 years has been one of the most stable climatic periods which it's it's so fundamental to life on earth we never really think about it but if we 
You know, if we went into the grips of an ice age today, the world would be completely different. Um, so it's interesting thinking about, you know, putting ourselves in the in the shoes of the people that would have lived back then to what, you know, what life would have been like and how on earth you'd come out of something like that and then invent agriculture and, you know, build civilization. One thing that we'll look at in future episodes on this topic is the, the genetic uh, information about what was happening at the time because we, we do know populations potentially plummeted um, and, but also there you know there's ways to kind of track for instance the genetic lines of wheat and animal husbandry and so it's a very interesting line of environmental evidence that kind of you build this picture around what humans were doing and then you can kind of tell you know what was happening but it's just like to me that the younger dryas is such a like it still it sends kind of chills to my bones like thinking about you know our ancestors lived through that and you know in a way there's a lot of you know Brett's was talking about these cataclysmic events that do happen on the planet and you know we've kind of failed to talk about that these things do happen in our time and the one interesting example is you know from the discovery of dinosaurs which wasn't all that long ago um, to the point of understanding where they went so that when as soon as all these dinosaur bones showed up. It was only in the, the 1800s, really, that we, and then early 1900s, where we admitted there were dinosaurs, or we, we um, amassed enough evidence. But then, what happened is that it wasn't until the 1990s that we understood that there was a comet hit, and we had to find the crater. And that, so that black mat, there has been another body of evidence that shows potentially there was maybe a um, an event from outer space that could have cause this kind of mass terror across the planet. Yeah, and that's one of the things that Brett's had trouble proving, you know, what caused... It's all well and good saying something caused this, but what exactly caused it, he couldn't pinpoint. And He never tried to either. He just said, well, look, look at... This is clearly sudden. It yeah, doesn't, it doesn't matter, matter what, what caused it. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it is. Here's the evidence. Um, so, yeah, there is... It's very controversial. Controversial. I think there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of debate still going on, and it has been for the last... I don't know, 20 plus years as to what caused the earth changes during the Younger Dryas. But yeah, there are these strange kind of spikes in the record that show, you know, elevated levels of platinum and elevated levels of iridium and, you know, these things known as um, impact proxies, um, evidence that pops up in the soil in the sediment layer that point towards uh, cosmic impact. You know, it's the same with the dinosaur extinctions. They found this ab abnormal layer of um, iridium in the soil and from there they decided well it must have been something cosmic that caused the dinosaur extinctions and then the next step was finding the crater but they wouldn't agree no one would agree on that until they found the crater they wouldn't there was all this evidence around and you kind of look at it now and say oh well, of course it was a crater but it's not that easy until you have the evidence in front of you but if you kind of th see we're in that stage now i'm not saying that it's definitely a comet but you know there's enough evidence to show that there was some kind of um you know outside influence that affected the geology of earth and you know there's also talk of a solar flares and different changes in solar activity which we do have evidence for as well and so it's interesting like i think you know that it took decades for the di for the dinosaurs uh to be um reconciled as being you know wiped off by a media and you know there's even arguments saying that they weren't wiped out they were they gradually kind of limped along but I'm just my kind of thought is that you know have we advanced a l long enough now where we don't need all of that where we can make some kind of you know guided conclusion without that last step I, I don't know that's where I kind of you know can we make those kind of um, I don't know maybe you'd say conclusion but at least you know maybe we don't need to find an impact and they talk about because there was such a large ice sheet there did it hit the ice sheet and then disappear there's all these kind of explanations and the black mat and the um, high levels of iridium and platinum and so forth, all they, they spread over a very, very big um, array of. of yeah, Earth. I think I think it's something like 50 million square kilometers. Um, it, it, like that, the, there's an area of the Earth that spans that amount of space, that shows these impact proxies that date to this kind of younger Dryas period. And I guess it doesn't really. It, I mean, it is very important to work out what caused it, but just acknowledging that it was. Um, and 
there was a lot of insane earth changes going on at the time is almost enough to um to get the, to get the context in place and to really understand that there were you know these things going on that we can't explain but well, we we don't need to know what caused it to you know place um any kind of understanding about you know, can we reframe our idea of the agricultural revolution based on that? We know the, we basically know the conditions that it went through. We don't know what caused the conditions, but do we need that? Yeah, I don't think we do. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, my perspective on history of the planet has changed after learning about the Younger Dryas and learning about the context going into the agricultural revolution. It's kind of like raises more questions than I had ever had before because it's it's just blown everything right open. It's like, how did we... You know, did we just invent agriculture straight after? If you look at the progression of humans on Earth, you know, evolutionary, we, we show that you know, there's evidence now that our progression moved from um, you know, tree-based plant eaters to, uh, to meat and, and cooking meat. And that really shifted our move to big brains. You know, there's a lot of arguments around that. But so this dietary change fueled our move to our modern brain. But then the next change you see that significantly shifts the craniofacial form is the agricultural revolution. And so to have that huge um, change happen, you know, during our time on earth, it really does, you know, I, I don't know, I, I, for me, it's difficult to reconcile those kind of conditions and then that kind of innovation moving forward, but maybe they had to, maybe humans had to innovate in that way in order to survive. And that's why it accumulated. It's, it, it's an interesting topic anyway, isn't it? Yeah, and it, it's really... It's really interesting talking to people because there's a lot there's a lot of research going on at the moment into that period in particular of Earth's history and you know um, not only geologically and anthropologically but also in the archaeological record there are these ancient sites that pop up at exactly the same time that are so sophisticated and so advanced that they they couldn't have been made by hunter gatherers or if they were it would have required a huge workforce. Um, and it, it all dates to the period just after the Younger Dryas when, you know, for the last 1,200 years, people were trying to run from this, these insane um, global events that were going on. 11,600 years. And that's right happening at the, uh, the Fertile Crescent where we put, you know, the Garden of Eden and all the, our modern, you know, you call them myths. I, I don't like the word myth, but, um, you know, our creation or not, not creation, but, um, yeah. These kind of stories are embedded into many, many traditional cultures, but the one that we attribute our modern society to is, is sprouting the farming agriculture revolution from you know, the Turkey Syria region, where this archaeological site Gebekli Tepe pops up, which is just, and we'll cover that in our next show, um, because it's so fascinating to see this area of um, you know, archaeological. Uh, evidence popping up and coinciding with geological evidence and then once you kind of you you start to see a picture that does potentially tell us that there's more to history than maybe we were really put in the book for me i've been really obsessed and focused on understanding the agricultural revolution and the younger dryers and all these geological uh marking points have really helped me to well further my you know understanding of potentially what happened and you know i I think next next week we're going to look at gebekli tepe and the archaeological findings there but contextualize it within you know arising from this younger dries period and so yeah i'm really excited to and we're just going to push forward and you know the human origin project is all about following these lines of evidence and you know it really does paint as long as you stick to the storyline it yeah i'm I'm just amazed every day of what we're finding. It's, it's quite remarkable, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And I think learning about Gobekli Tepe was so fascinating, but then just, and putting it in the context of um, appearing straight after the Younger Dryas has just made it even more fascinating because it's, it, it comes out of nowhere. You know, it shouldn't exist. Up until, we, up until it was unearthed, it was thought that nothing of that size or sophistication could exist because it's, it's older than the tools that they thought could build it. it it's... Yeah, something like 6,000 years older than Stonehenge or 7,000 years older than Stonehenge, which just doesn't, they just, I can't even fathom those numbers. Yeah, if, if you're interested in the Younger Dryas, jump on the humanoriginproject.com and check out. There's a number of articles on there discussing all of these um, these 
research areas from Brett's to to the climate change to sea level uh, rises and megafauna of uh, the Clovis culture, all of those are covered on the sites and we really want to push forward a discussion as to, you know, what do you think happens? So come on, leave a comment on social media and on iTunes. And if you enjoyed the show, please leave a rating. Thank you for listening to today's show. For more information, you can read the full transcript, articles, and discussion on our website, humanoriginproject.com. You can visit us on social media at Human Origin Project on Facebook and the Human Origin Project on Instagram. Follow us on Twitter or join the forum boards and email list to keep up to date with all the new information. And if you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe on iTunes and leave a review because it helps others to find this information and helps us to bring you the topics you want to discuss and hear about. Until next week, I hope your life is filled with happiness, healthiness, and harmony.